to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. The Runnings forwarded a video message uh, from the Bishop of the Metropolitan DC Lutheran Synod. And I'd like to try to share part of it uh, now. This uh, may or may not work very well. First, I'm gonna do this. Oh dear, see this always happens to me. Ah. All right, um, pardon me. We'll make it smaller. Thank you for your patience. There we go. All right. Are you able to see it? Uh oh. Okay, good. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and mm -hmm. Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, clergy from Delaware, Maryland and Metro Washington DC synods gathered in prayer as protest at Luther Place Memorial Church in Washington DC. What began as a solemn, peaceful witness was interrupted by self-identified Trump supporters who barged into the encircled sacred space held by those present. These individuals proceeded to reenact the murder of George Floyd in front of the Black Lives Matter sign and Martin Luther statue. In the words of my colleague and friend Bishop Bill Gole of the Delaware Maryland Synod, this holy ground was desecrated by those who mocked our purpose and prayer, including a man dressed in a faux animal skin vest who made fun of, quote, that N-word, George Floyd. This is a surreal experience that our Black, Indigenous, and people of color colleagues know all too well. Kyrie liaison, close quote. The church season of Epiphany started that very same day, Wednesday. Epiphany means manifest. I have a favorite definition of it, which is aha. It's that moment when we see the truth. Oh, that's the truth of what's been there all along. Sadly, the events of this week in our capital are an epiphany of the very worst kind. The bishops experience to me, perhaps even more than the brazen insurrection in the Capitol building, reveals the evil at the root of such lawlessness. People's delight in violating the humanity of others based solely on their race people's sick disregard for all that is sacred in faith and in our common life together as a nation. Tragically, this epiphany reveals that what we've always assumed was, quote, over there is also here. At first glance, these uh, gospel readings, and I did choose two, um, seem as serene and removed from our recent chaos as anything can be. First, those dignified magi willing to cross Asia, following a star of wonder, star of light into foreign territory, and finally finding the babe they were seeking. But what our nativity set kings don't show us is King Herod himself, the cruel despot, lurking too close for safety. When he learns the Messiah has been born, he commands the slaughter of all Jewish boys. And you have to understand, he was Jewish himself. He commands the slaughter of all Jewish boys younger than two years old. Can you even imagine that? And why? Just to protect his power. 
His subjects mean nothing to him. His power means everything. A little too close for comfort, that story. Why this passage, though, on the day of Epiphany? Well, it's because the Magi themselves have an epiphany. You know, what they found, none of it conformed to the expectations they would have had. But they didn't turn around and go home when they found themselves at a stable door instead of a palace courtyard. They didn't look in and decide, well, this child is just way too common and poor to deserve our gifts. They didn't turn up their noses and decide the whole journey was a waste of time. Nope. They managed to let go of their cherished illusions because in their wisdom, they could see if this peasant baby is the long awaited king, it doesn't mean we've calculated wrong. It means God is about to turn the status quo on its head. Divisions and hostilities will cease. After all, even we magi, they must have said to themselves, condemned by this baby's own people, were led to him before anyone else. These wise ones in their wisdom saw the heart of God revealed in fragile baby flesh. Only love of the most cosmic and intimate kind could have orchestrated this. In their wisdom, they could see love is at the heart of the universe. Aha. Next comes John the Baptist, this uh, intense, fiery guy, impatient to set the world straight. Eventually, King Herod has him arrested and executed. Another reminder that today's story isn't so far removed from things that happen in today's world. At this point, though, he's out in the wilderness and he's freeing people from the weight of their sins by immersing them, or we say baptizing, that's the Greek word, baptizing them in the Jordan River. And John says, you know, this is what I'm doing. It's all just preparation. For whom? I honestly don't know. I just know he's on his way and he is so powerful. I'm not worthy to tie his shoes. John's epiphany comes when he recognizes the truth that's been in front of him all his life, which is that the one he's been waiting and preparing for is his cousin, his own cousin, Jesus. And then John sees for himself the very breath of God. Ruach, the Hebrew word, which means breath or wind or spirit. John sees that Ruach ripping. That's what the Hebrew word or the Greek word is, ripping the heavens wide open and cascading down on Jesus. Jesus is immersed by God's spirit every bit as much as he had been in the water. I'm thinking even those who were present must have felt God's breath on them and in them. God's breath of peace, comfort, truth, life, power, and most of all, love. You are my beloved with whom I'm well pleased. What's the epiphany here? It's the same as the Magi received, that through Jesus, 
God reveals God's heart, which is love. Aha. How did these biblical epiphanies, though, shed any light on Wednesday's epiphany? The answer to that, friends, lies in whether we, we ourselves, can see one more epiphany. This epiphany is about you and me. Can we see ourselves through the eyes of God and see what's been true about us all along? This truth is you have been created by love. You live in God's love, and you are called to love. Can you take that to heart? It takes courage to believe you are so profoundly loved that you need never be afraid. It takes even more courage to accept and demonstrate that the love in you is the light the world needs. I wanna say that again. It takes even more courage to accept and demonstrate that the love in you is the light the world needs. I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm not talking about sappy love. I'm calling about love, talking about love that calls us to do things and be things we're pretty sure we don't have it in us to do. I'm talking about love that in the public square becomes justice for all. I'm talking about love that in the halls of government and at the ballot box becomes protection of democracy that exists for everybody. Not the democracy of identity politics, I'm this and you're that. Not the democracy of polarization, but democracy that is fragile and tenacious and for all. Does love seem too weak to you to counter the evil manifested on Wednesday? Love so often seems like little more than a way to sell perfume or movies. I think we forget that love has real power to cast out fear, to instill hope, to shed the light of truth on sin and evil, and to give voice to those without names. Friday night, I watched a frontline show about Maria Ressa the Filipina journalist who is standing up to the increasingly oppressive measures of Duterte. I'm not sure that Duarte. She's been arrested repeatedly. She's been publicly threatened by the president. And even though she could quite easily live in the United States, she chooses to wear her bulletproof vest and report the lies of the president to speak out and to tell the truth. At one point she's in a hotel room and she's preparing a speech and she's asking herself it's, if it's too schmaltzy, but finally she decides that what she must say is this, anger and fear divide. It's not with hate, but with hope and love that we hold the line. At her staff Christmas party, she quotes Bono, 
You can't fight monsters by becoming monsters. And she goes on to her staff, what prevents us from becoming monsters? It's one word. It starts with L. And of course, they all shout, love. That, what we see in Maria Ressa, that is the bold courage of love. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, fellow members of the body of Christ, you are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Aha. Everyone has now seen the epiphany of evil that erupted on Wednesday. It has its own belief systems and saints and creeds and rituals. But how many have seen the epiphany at the heart of God that needs to be seen and known. That is our reason for being, our Redeemer's Lutheran Church. Our vision statement says it clearly. We are a community in the model of Christ, Christ who revealed God's heart of love. And that is why we are inclusive and caring. That is why we must be willing to accept challenges and take risks for the life of the world. God calls us to bravely, hopefully, wisely, openly live out our baptismal calling in the power of God's own spirit, in the self-giving love that is traced in the form of a cross on our foreheads at our baptism and in the mission that we share. We're called to reflect the light of Christ into our world in our times with bold and boundless love. I want to close with a quote. Sarah Miles was a war correspondent, and she grew up scorning Christians as lazy thinking, uh, wishful, uh, no goods. Um, but somehow, she found herself coming to faith. Here's what Miles says. At the heart of Christianity is a power that continues to speak to and transform us. As I found to my surprise and alarm, it could speak even to me, not in the sappy Jesus and cookies tone of mild mannered liberal Christianity or the blustering blaming hellfire of the religious right. What I heard and continue to hear is a voice that can crack religious and political convictions open, that advocates for the least qualified, least official, least likely, that upsets the established order and makes a joke of certainty. It proclaims against reason that the hungry will be fed, that those cast down will be raised up, and that all things, including my own failures, are being made new. It offers food without exception to the worthy and unworthy, the screwed up and the pious, and then commands everyone to do the same. It doesn't promise to solve or erase suffering, but to transform it pleading that by loving one another, even through pain, we will find more life. And it insists that by opening ourselves to strangers, the despised or frightening or unintelligible other, 
we will see more and more of the holy, since without exception, all people are one body, God's. Aha. Sarah Miles' eloquent words remind me how important it is, as St. Paul says in Romans 12, that we who follow Jesus not be shaped by this world, but be transformed so that we live from the gospel and are able to overcome evil with good. This is our hope. This is our calling. This is the love revealed in Jesus, God's epiphany. Aha. Thanks be to God. Amen.